Well, today I'm joined by Dr. Samuel Klumpenhauer. Dr. Klumpenhauer holds a PhD in medieval studies from the University of Toronto. And today we're going to be talking about his incredibly ambitious, I think, project, uh, incredibly exciting project of translating the Glossa Ordinaria, specifically the section on Genesis. And uh, just as someone who loves books, I have to say that uh, this book is absolutely beautiful. It's huge. It's probably going to take up the full frame here. Um, but it, it's really incredible. And what I love about it is, and we're going to talk about this in a bit, but the way in which it was printed. So it's printed as it would have been with these kind of three sections there. A absolutely stunning. Um, but Dr. Klumpenhauer, thanks so much for being here. Oh, well, my pleasure. Glad to, glad to be here. So tell me a little bit about this project. I mean, it's ambitious, as I said, in multiple ways. So not just from translating a text that has had such influence, but wasn't really readily available in English, but also to then present it in a way that's kind of faithful to the style of, of the glossa. Mm -hmm. how, how did this come about? So it came about, I first came to know of this text during my time in, in Toronto at the Center, Medieval, Center for Medieval Studies, where I received my PhD. And I wasn't working directly with um, this text at the time, but I was working with other texts from the early universities, especially with uh, on church law and so forth. And a number of my friends were working with uh, theological texts. And in both faculties, that of law and that of theology, there was this practice in the early uh, schools of, of glossing a text of these as a as a teacher read through the text, they would make little notes. And over time, often these became authoritative. And so I worked a fair bit with the with the legal notes. And then uh, after I had graduated, uh, I returned to to my first love uh, to the Bible and, and uh, wanted to delve into the notes, the glosses on on the Bible. And uh, I, there's no English translation. I had thankfully uh, been well schooled in Latin by that time that I could still access the text myself, but I wanted to make the text available to English readers. And so I set about translating at least the section on Genesis, which is what that volume is. And I'm working on more volumes now. Uh, if I had known at the start how long it would take me to finish the project, I, I probably wouldn't have done it. But thanks be to God, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And uh, so I, and with the support of my wife, I, I was able to dedicate uh, the time needed to finish the project and publish it through Emmaus Academic Press, which is uh, out of the uh, University of Steubenville, Franciscan University of Steubenville. And they were wonderful to work with. And, and finally, thanks be to God, we got it done and ready for y'all to enjoy yourselves. I love it. And I appreciate we were talking uh, before we started here that, that you're from, uh, Canada, which people might have heard with the abouts there, but I heard a y'all there at the end. So you have been uh, in Texas sufficiently long to have uh, picked up the parlance, uh, but I, I appreciate it. So you mentioned a couple times there that it, it took a while and I appreciate the shout out to your wife for her patience as well in this. Um, I think about my, my wife who's outside the door now waiting for a uh, date night tonight, but only after the, uh, the gospel simplicity projects are over. And I just am curious, how long did this take? The the bulk of it was over over 2021 uh, COVID year. And that was every, as my wife will tell you, that was every minute, every spare minute I could find. I was, I was working on this. Um, we have a daughter now. We didn't at the time. So I was able to devote far more time than I would now. But uh, yes, every spare minute of the day over that year and a bit over the previous and post after that year too. Um, but the bulk of it in 2021, in, in the year of the plague. Yeah, you know, that was a year uh, of lo lots of suffering uh, for so many mm -hmm. and lots of turmoil. Don't want to make light of that in any way. But it was a year of uh, quite prodigious output, I think, for a lot mm -hmm. of people uh, as they were able to find time that they didn't have before to, to spend on projects. And so if there is a silver lining, it, it's projects like these that perhaps wouldn't have come to fruition or perhaps wouldn't have come to fruition as quickly. Um, I'm sure it didn't feel quick uh, as without it. I, I want to get into uh, the Glossa in just a minute, but I can't help but note that I think for a lot of people, but not the people who watch my channel, for a lot of people, hearing that you spent the bulk of your time doing your PhD on uh, the notes of medieval canon law might feel about as far from fun for a lot of people. But for the people who watch Gospel Simplicity, I think they 
would say, actually, that sounds fascinating. And so what I want to know is what drew you to medieval canon law for your PhD work? Mm. Yes. And that was um, uh, like so many things that was fortuitous. There was a professor that I had met uh, during my undergraduate years. So I was 10 years in, in Toronto at the university there. And in my undergraduate years, I, I met uh, one of the professors there, Giulio Solano, who uh, has spent his life working with with medieval canon law and and understood it in a way that I've never seen anyone else do. And, and to us, law sounds dry and, and boring and and lifeless, but that was certainly not the case to Professor Solano and certainly not the case to to the jurists of the Middle Ages. This was an act of love. This was an act of uh, service to the church. And uh, so it was his love that was passed on to me. And, and so I spent uh, much of my PhD working uh, in a focused way on medieval canon law, but at also canon law, theology, et cetera, in this period of history, in the, in the 1100s and the 1200s, uh, these are all unified in a way that um, that we don't appreciate much anymore. Now we think of these things as very distinct theology, canon law, but at this point in history, there's a, there's a fair bit of overlap and you can't study one thing without studying all the things. And so, uh, you know, I was always working with theological texts alongside this. And the textbook, the main book I'm, I'm speaking of here of, of canon law in the Middle Ages is, is Gratian's Decretum, which is a collection of excerpts similar to, to the Glossa Ordinaria. It's a collection of excerpts from the Bible, from church councils, etc., and it's commentary on these. And so the structure of canon law and how it was studied in the Middle Ages is very similar to that of theology. I love how those things were integrated for you. And so often I talk to people today about how academics have this uh, perhaps unfortunate reality of forcing us to kind of hyper-specialize and that we can become so siloed. But I appreciate that, you know, in the medieval era, something like canon law isn't distinct from theology and that your study was likewise not distinct from theology. That's encouraging to hear I, we could talk about canon law uh, for quite a while, uh, but I, I do want to get to the glossa. I, I'm going to just call it that for short at times. I think you do as well, so mm -hmm. I think I'm in fair company there. Um, but at the most basic level, I mean, you mentioned kind of notes on scripture, but what is the glossa ordinaria? Ah, <laughs> uh, let me take you back, let's say about the year 1100 in, in France. And at this point in time, there are no universities yet. There's no University of Paris. Uh, Italy is a bit of a different story, but let's put that aside for a moment. Uh, in France, there, there's no universities yet. The University of Paris is about 50 years away. What there are is a number of schools attached to cathedrals, attached to uh, monastic institutions, etc. And, and they are starting to study, not in uh, as systematic ways, I think, but they're starting to study uh, things in a more disciplined way, in, in, in a more um, set way, in a more scholastic way. So we're, th we're talking here about the birth of the universities, the birth of scholasticism. And at the heart of all of this is, is the Lexio. So you would have a master, a, a well-trained master with great memory, with great uh, um, uh, aptitude, and he would read the text. There would be a Lexio, a lecture, which, which the word comes from a, a reading. So he would read the text and people would listen. Uh, other young scholars would listen. And as he read through the text slowly, very carefully, he would gloss the text. He would stop every now and then and make certain comments or explanations about, you know, what this or that word meant, say if uh, what the culture of the time meant, why they, the Old Testament figures were doing this or that, or how does this apply to our life today? Or how does these events in the Old Testament apply to uh, the revelation of Christ. Uh, how does the old apply to the New Testament? And so he would gloss the text. He would he would make comments, and sometimes he would write these comments in himself. Perhaps sometimes the students would would have a copy of the biblical text and write these comments. It's not exactly clear how the text comes about, but over time, a, a, a particular collection of glosses um, becomes authoritative. So the word gloss, by the way, means glossa from it's a Latin word, but from the Greek. Uh, language or tongue. So these are, this is in a way that the tongue of scripture, the explanation of the scripture. And 
over time, a particular collection of these notes became authoritative. And so at first the gloss is just a descriptive word. There's glosses on all kinds of books, not just the Bible on canon law, as I mentioned in, in other works as well. But over time, a particular set of these notes became authoritative or standard or the ordinaria. And that's where the title comes. It's a, it's a descriptive title, the glossa ordinaria. It's not called, it's just called the glossa at first, the gloss. If you read Thomas Aquinas, he'll, he'll cite the gloss. Um, I did a search once thousands of times. I think there's about 4,000 citations to the gloss in, in the works of Thomas Aquinas. And so this particular gloss soon became standard, ordinaria, and it was the most important Bible commentary. And we can think of it. It's, it's not exactly a Bible commentary as we think of it today, but um, for our purposes, we can call it a Bible commentary. And it was the, the standard Bible commentary of the Middle Ages uh, which had an immense influence and uh, today is forgotten, but was once uh, one of the most popular texts that people were reading. I love how you took us back to what it would be like to be a student in the Middle Ages there and how this played a role in that. It led me to a question that I hadn't thought of previously, but I think perhaps will be interesting to the audience. So in one way, this is going to tell us a lot about how people read scripture in this time, which we'll get to in a moment, and I think will be very illuminating. But I wonder if it also might shed different light on how we think about this thing called scholasticism, which can come in for a lot of criticism, and sometimes I think perhaps a bit unfairly. Um, but given kind of how important the glossa was in people like, for people like Aquinas, and maybe the role it had in what we think of scholasticism today, what might it tell us about how maybe scholastics were, were connected to scripture? Because I, I mm -hmm. think maybe the kind of caricature, right, um, would be that, so we have the rise of scholasticism and people move away from scripture and towards Aristotle or something like that. They move away from the Bible and towards abstract theorizing. And I think like most caricatures, that leaves a whole lot out. And I wonder if maybe the glossa can maybe shed a little light on a more full orbed picture of scholasticism? Big question. Hopefully you see maybe where I'm getting at there, but any thoughts on that? This video is brought to you in part by Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is an organization of Christian counselors that exists to help you get the help you need. You can find them by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. And when you use that link, which you can find in the description down below, you will get 10% off your first month and they'll pair you up with a licensed mental health counselor in under 48 hours. Once you've been paired up with a counselor, you can reach them via instant message, phone call, video call, and more. I think you will really enjoy this, and I think it could be the first step on your journey to greater mental health. And mental health problems affect all of us, religious, non-religious, old, young, every demographic feels the weight of mental health. But there are resources available, and you don't need to go through this alone, which is why I encourage you to reach out to the amazing people at Faithful Counseling by using that link, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, and taking your first step towards healing and wholeness in your mental health. Yes, uh, so you can talk about this on the level of institution. If we talk about the heart of scholasticism, especially with theology, you know, that's tied up with the story of the University of Paris. And the, at the foundation of the University of Paris is this study of the Bible that that I was just describing. This is the first textbook, if you will, of the University of Paris and, and the gloss, the gloss ordinaria is uh, deeply connected with all of that. And, and scholasticism, so what's happening is that um, the masters are, are lecturing on the Bible. And as they're lecturing, there's both explanatory notes they need to make about what does this or that word mean, but there's also disputed questions that arise. Um, maybe there's, uh, it, you, you read the four gospels and maybe you, it seems like they don't exactly line up. So there's a question with how do these different accounts line up with each other? And so they then go, the masters and, and the students to some degree are, are then going to go and turn to the church fathers. They're going to turn to other parts of scripture for a way to resolve these, these disputed questions. And, and out of this comes the, the disputatio, this kind of, uh, we're going to gather some authorities on one side and make a case for one part and, and gather authorities on the other side and make another case. And then we're going to 
harmonize these things as much as we can. And this is what um, Thomas Aquinas is doing in the Summa as well. He's he's marshalling evidence for two sides of an argument and then and then coming up with some kind of um, solution, either a harmony or or taking one or the other side. And this project, scholasticism that I'm just describing, is uh, connected at its root with the study of the Bible. If we take one of the most famous um, explanations of the scholastic method uh, by Abelard in a book called Seek et Non, where he talks about this, uh, how to deal with these conflicting sources of authority, etc. Uh, all his examples are, are biblical or theological examples. And so scholasticism is not a, a turn away from the Bible. It, it's, it's growing out of the study of the Bible, uh, very much so. That's really helpful. And I think, you know, one of the great, uh, one of the great burdens I have for this channel is to try to tear down some caricatures that are unhelpful to try to, um, help us understand history better, but not just as an end in itself. I think understanding history better helps us understand one another better and have better conversations move forward in our maybe theological disagreements or in working together on different things. And I think for a lot of people, scholasticism is one of those things that, uh, just, is really misunderstood. So I'm glad we could talk about that just a little bit there. You mentioned uh, how the the glossa is working in its um, engagement with scripture so that there might be explanation of words, there might be kind of these disputations of, okay, it seems like these contradict, where do we go? How do we settle this? And you're looking to the fathers and seeing how they talked about it. But I wonder, uh, in addition to that, what about just like maybe even not just the questions they are solving, perhaps those, um, but maybe some of the things they take for granted as well. I'm not, not quite sure, but what, what does their engagement with scripture show us about how people read the Bible at this time? I'm guessing it might be a little different than perhaps the like historical critical or whatever uh, methods that people are used to today. So in broad strokes, big question again, but what, what can we learn from them in terms of just method and how they're approaching scripture? Mm -hmm. First and foremost, scripture is for them a unity. There is no specialization in Old and New Testament that we encounter in scripture scholars today. They, they study scripture as a unity. Uh, not they don't. So as they work through the books of the Old Testament, they're constantly studying the New Testament as they study the New Testament, they're constantly studying the Old Testament. And so they, they are not studying books individually or sections of books individually or, uh, you know, uh, the kind of sources that we talk about today, especially with the Pentateuch. They're not studying these different sources individually. The, the Bible is a unity. And so they approach everything uh, with that conviction that all of this is a unity and is harmonious. And though we can't see that harmony or hear that harmony all the time it's there and uh it's and and the, the pious reader and you can't r understand the bible without faith to a certain degree you can understand certain things but you can't uh plumb its depths without faith uh, but for those who approach the bible with uh the rigor that's needed and with the faith that's needed uh this harmony uh, awaits them Two, so one thing, the Bible is a unity. Also, there are in the Bible uh, multiple senses, multiple meanings. There's on the face of it, the literal or the historical meaning. And this is basically what people study, the Bi how people study the Bible today. They're looking for, you know, what do the words mean? So they're going to delve into the context of um, when it was written, into the cultural culture of the time. They're going to delve into uh, linguistic analysis. And so they're doing all of that in the Middle Ages as well. But that's all um, the literal, and it's, it doesn't exhaust the meaning of Scripture. You know, the, the author's intention, et cetera, is there, but it doesn't exhaust the meaning of Scripture. There is, beneath the literal meaning, uh, other senses of Scripture uh, in a spiritual sense, which can be divided up into allegory, namely how does the Old Testament um, well, how does everything in the Bible point to the work of Christ and the church? There is also a moral meaning, and this isn't just the moral commands, say, of the Ten Commandments, but everything in the Bible, um, for instance, the Exodus, the, the very fact of the Exodus itself points us to a certain moral 
about how the soul escapes sin, etc. And then there's also an anagogical meaning in terms of how does uh, scripture point to to the final judgment and to the end of times. Really interesting, a couple layers there uh, of meaning and of ways of coming to the text. I want to ask two questions related to this. So we're seeing now how they read scripture. And you pointed out those those two points there, which was helpful. I want to maybe zoom back to our time a little bit. On the one hand, what do you see that they're... Pro- hmm. Okay, what are maybe we missing that they give us in a way that is not just different than what we have, but you think is actually like good and needed? And then on the other hand, maybe we'll get there in a second of, I wonder if there's anything that you think maybe they could learn from us or that, you know, you wouldn't just adopt wholesale. But let's stick to the first one for now. When you look at how the Bible is being read generally, and feel free to talk to your context or more broadly than that, um, what do you think like we could really use from this time that they just got it and we just, we just don't and we need it? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, let me bring the the listener back to this episode at the end of the Gospel of Luke, uh, the road to Emmaus, when after the the resurrection of Christ, there's these two disciples. They don't know yet um, that Christ is resurrected, but but they're on the road to Emmaus, and and this man comes and and meets them and 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 walks along with them and discusses the scriptures, which at that time at the Old Testament, let's say, um, and uh, they continue walking and then. Uh, they they have uh, supper later, and in the in the breaking of the bread, they finally realize what's going on, who this man is, and they finally understand the scriptures in the breaking of the bread. And so we we can understand here that the scriptures, as the medievals understood, you you can't understand the Old Testament without the new, and and likewise the new um, uh, is also you need the Old Testament to understand the new. The, the old is revealed in the new and the new is hidden in the old and these provide a unity and it's in communion that you start to understand understand these scriptures and it's in a liturgical setting as well that you understand these scriptures and so you, you can't divorce biblical interpretation from this wider community and, and this wider liturgy and you can't understand the scripture without reference to Christ and so uh, for Genesis which is the portion I've translated as you read through it everything is being understood in relation to Christ. So a, now sometimes this is uh, in a way easy to do, for instance, with the example of Abraham and, and the sacrifice or the near sacrifice of Isaac, the parallels here between that and the story of Christ's sacrifice, uh, where Christ carries his cross, Abraham uh, puts the wood upon the shoulders of Isaac for the sacrifice. Sometimes it's a bit easier to do that, but that level of interpretation is flows throughout everything. So Isaac is a type of Christ, but so too is Joseph. Joseph, who is thrown into the prison and, and later comes out of prison and saves his people, just as Christ descends into hell and, and, and saves his people. And so they are reading everything with an eye to Christ. He is the, the key to understanding the scripture at every level. And now this does not do away with the literal interpretation they they are steadfast and, and dedicated to the literal interpretation and it's the foundation but their view of things is that the letters the words of scripture apply to something real so the word abraham applies to the historical person abraham and that's the literal meaning for them uh, but abraham himself the actual person of abraham that he himself has a meaning that points to christ and this is the allegorical meaning so just as words refer to things, the literal meanings so do to things, refer to other things, to f- deeper realities, and that's the allegorical meaning. And so this is uh, a rich way of viewing scripture because Christ is at the heart of all of it. It certainly is rich. And I remember the first time coming across some of these ways of seeing scripture and just feeling like the Bible's a whole new book for me. Like there's a world of possibilities. And I've continued to feel that way at different times when engaging with church fathers or uh, medieval authors and just going, I would have never seen that in scripture. Like the way that they're using scriptures, they see things that I would have never seen were there. And some people might argue simply aren't there, which could be a conversation for another day. But 
what I do want to get to is this question of, for you, are these uh, these medieval masters who are giving these these glosses that make up the, the Glossa Ordinaria, are they kind of our interpreters par excellence? Like, as readers today, is our goal simply to read the way they read? Like, they they cracked the code. They figured it out. Or do you think they got a lot right, but maybe there's some things that we wouldn't swallow um, kind of in one gulp from their, um, from their method? Or I guess the other option, I don't think from the way we've talked and the fact that you've spent this much time uh, devoted to it, uh, but you could say, actually, I think they're just wrong about how they do it. It's abstractly interesting. You know, I can fill a, a dissertation or two, but, uh, or 12, 100, um, but you know, it's actually not a good idea. What, where would you land on that spectrum and perhaps why? So the, the Glossa Ordinaria, though it, it becomes standard and, and very popular, it's never um, an official book of, of theology. It's used in the schools, but it doesn't take on a, a type of authority that, say, um, uh, the Talmud does and the Mishnah does in, in the case of Judaism. It, it, never, it never becomes that important. In other words, that this is a helpful tool. It was never meant to be exhaustive. It, it wasn't intended to be exhaustive ever. And so it um, is, is one particular uh, Bible commentary, but it's not intended to be exhaustive. And, and those who, who buy a copy will notice that, you know, there's far more to be said about everything. This is um, in many ways a textbook. So you're going to get about the information that, that you would get in a, in a, in a course, in a university course on Genesis, uh, a fair bit of detail, but certainly not exhaustive. And so there's a limitation to it that way. Um, in terms of its reading of scripture, I, I think it's theologically correct to see that, yes, the Bible is a unity and yes, Christ is um, prophesied both explicitly and, and implicitly uh, in the Old Testament, that all of this is part of God's plan and that it's not it's not a misreading to see Christ in the Old Testament, that that's not, um, Christians didn't take this book and impose uh, a meaning foreign to it. Uh, again, that these things were always uh, leading up to Christ. And so I think that's correct. Um, in terms of the literal, um, they had a deep sensitivity to the literal meaning of scripture, certainly. Um, they, they didn't spend as much time, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but I think that's probably fair to say they didn't spend as much time on it because, you know, in a modern um, biblical studies course, all your time will be spent on the literal meaning. And for them, it wasn't all spent on that. Um, so there were there were certain sensitivities, certain knowledge of, of the cultures of the time that, that they didn't have access to through no fault of their own. Um, they weren't as well versed in in languages that scholars are today. Um, even Greek was was a bit spotty in, in the year 1100. Um, and so there's certain linguistic analyses that, that we know more about today, um, but they approach scripture with a desire to be transformed. And, and you can't understand or appreciate scripture without that desire. In other words, their approach to scripture was not um, critical. It was not, it, it didn't approach scripture in the same way it approached other books. The Bible was unique. And so it needs to have a unique interpretive framework. And, uh, you know, once you approach the Bible um, with the eyes of faith, once you approach the Bible with a desire and with a prayer to the Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible, that he might also inspire or reveal to you um, what it means. Um, this is when you're really going to get into the, the Bible as, a, as something that's going to transform you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that reminds me of someone who gave your book an endorsement on the back, who's also been on the channel, Hans Borsma, and his like uh, sacramental reading of scripture. And if people want to uh, check out that interview, they're they're more than welcome to. Um, they can find it on the channel. But I I really appreciate that. So if what I'm hearing is correct, it's essentially they got the method right, more or less. Um, especially uh, in terms of theological posture, maybe, which I think we don't often think about the the posture we have when coming to scripture, but I think it really impacts what we get out of it. And if anything, you know, maybe they could benefit from modern things that we have, like deeper study of the language and the culture. Uh, but it sounds like 
appreciating language and culture wouldn't go against their method. Like they, they cared for these things. They maybe just didn't have them in such uh, splendor as we have them today. Like we have so much information about the material culture and all of these things this time. Is that a fair way of summarizing there? Uh, certainly. And, and if you ever spend time with medieval texts, you'll notice that they have um, a deep love for etymologies. You'll be reading mm -hmm. a, li a life of a saint and they'll spend a page or two on the etymology of the name and they'll give you six different etymologies. So they had a love for languages for sure. Uh, they just didn't have a knowledge of these different languages uh, in the Middle Ages. But they loved and, and revered the authorities who did have knowledge of these languages, especially Jerome. Uh, with his expertise in, in Hebrew, uh, Greek, and Latin, and his commentaries uh, were, were copied over and over again and were, were revered as authoritative authorities, and you'll encounter them all the time in, in, in the Bible. And when they do finally uh, are, um, are exposed again to these languages, um, you know, the next hundred years after the gloss, especially the Greek fathers, you know, they're going to dive right back in and, and, and learn these languages as quick as they can. Um, and so it's not for lack of, of want that, that these things are lacking for them. It's just, it's just how it was at the time. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So I do want to hit on one point. So you mentioned Jerome, who casts this mm -hmm. immense shadow in, you know, long after his life. And I can think of a couple others, like Augustine, whose shadow is mm -hmm. equally, uh, if not greater. Like, it's super long, right? Super impactful guy, um, to put it lightly. But who... Who are some of these key voices that come out in the Glossop? Because I think you were starting to hint at it right there. It's not necessarily going to be like a representative sampling of the patristic period. Not necessarily because they disliked others. Some of it comes down to things like language, which or which texts get copied the most. I think we often forget like how lucky we are to have access to so many of these texts in English today. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but who are they pulling from who, when, when they encounter something that they're not sure how to figure out, or they need to kind of bolster a point or they're looking for wisdom and how other people have read who, who's at the top of that list for them. Right. So it was, the gloss was compiled in the middle ages and, and that's what the medievals, they had this genius for, for compilation, for organization. Uh, Lewis talks with this, their love of, uh, uh, sorting and, and all of this. It, it's not so much the romantic, we have this romantic imagery of the Middle Ages of the tournaments and the knights and so forth and and uh, the Arthurian legends and and that's there, but the 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 heart of the Middle Ages is actually more of these uh, um, meticulous monks who love sorting through things. And in this case, in the case of the gloss, they're sorting through the authorities that they have access to, which is largely going to be the Latin fathers. And this is uh, the, the two main names here are going to be Jerome and Augustine, for, especially for the gloss on Genesis. And they'll be, uh, um, uh, sometimes they're in opposition. They, they take different views on, say, the value of uh, the Septuagint, the Greek translation versus the, the Hebrew text, Jerome and Augustine. So the gloss is sometimes going to give you these contrasting opinions between Jerome and Augustine. Uh, other times... Um, for a, a more a moral meaning of the text, they'll often turn to Gregory the Great. Uh, for some of the um, more allegorical readings, not in Genesis, but in Exodus, they're going to turn a lot to Origen, who is a Greek father, but he was known through uh, to uh, the medieval West through many of his uh, homilies that have been translated into Latin. So they knew a fair bit of Origen too. Uh, but again, it's going to be the Latin fathers, Jerome, Augustine, and then Gregory the Great, Bede, and then all of these are going to be uh, filtered, if you will, through through collections of uh, patristic material from the 800s, from the 900s, people like Rabanus and, and so on. So there are many steps leading up to the Glossa Ordinaria. This process of sorting out um, didn't just happen overnight, that this was a, a centuries-long campaign, not in, a, in an intentional way, but in a factual way. Uh, but the root of it is going to be Augustine and Jerome. You know, you mentioned that love for sorting, which is not the most exciting thing from the outside. But I think we could say like Western civilization, Western culture was in so many ways saved by these monks that sorted mm -hmm. through things and made copies. And without them, we would be so much poorer. 
Um, and so I think we all have much, much thanks for their often thankless work that they did of sorting through manuscripts and copying by hand. This is no easy production by any means, but we are certainly uh, greater for it. And, and on that note, I mean, it's, yeah. it's not, they're not even, they're doing this out of a conviction. It's not a particularly profitable industry. They, they, you know, the saving literacy was, didn't make you rich for, for quite a while. It took a while for the industry of, you know, bookmaking to, to become profitable in that way. So they're going to immense effort and length and expense to, to save something that nobody cares all that much about at the time. And yet it's their conviction that leaves them. And ultimately th going back to, um, we were talking about the interpretation of the Bible and how the Bible is a unique book on like other books. Ultimately it's, it's because God chose to inspire the Bible. He chose to inspire human language written down. And if, if God would deign to, to condescend in that way, to, to inspire these human words, to speak through human authors, then there must be something special about literacy, about books. Um, most importantly about uh, the Bible, of course, but that kind of conviction and that, that esteem of the written word is going to bleed down into, into books in general. And, uh, and so, yes, it's, it's the monks who, who save literacy, who save uh, the written word for us. And I dare say you might, uh, you know, push back on this, but they, they, in some ways you stand in that tradition, right? Like, yes, this, this book is, I, I pray it sells many copies, it's probably not buying you and your wife like a home in Turks and Caicos, um, but you're doing it because you love it. And, and we're talking about it today on a Saturday because we love these things and we think they matter. And it's, uh, you know, translating Latin is not um, a, a task that makes you rich or famous, but <laughs> it's providing the church, it's providing, you know, all of us who uh, don't read Latin, or in my case, my Latin's a bit too rusty, I should use it more, um, an opportunity to engage with the text that we couldn't otherwise. And so I, I think it's beautiful that, that this tradition carries on. Before you get uh, any chance to be too humble or push back about that, I'm just going to keep going and, and steamroll over it. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, no. uh, but I'd be curious. So you did the gloss on Genesis. You're working on the next one. Um, but mm -hmm. we'll stick to Genesis for now. There has to be, I would think, uh, things and probably too many, but that stood out to you when you were translating this or reading it for the first time, perhaps, um, of just going, I would have never seen that. Like, that's the most interesting comment here, uh, whether because it's particularly insightful or it just feels completely off the wall uh, to you. But maybe could you just whet uh, the reader's appetite a bit for like, what are some of those things that they might encounter in this gloss that they wouldn't have seen coming? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's so many. Uh, there's this remarkable moment um, well, let me begin. There's the, there are these patterns in scripture that, uh, when, you, when you get to know scripture, well, that keep reappearing. And at first you don't notice them. You know, I, I grew up with the Bible and I'd read it multiple times and, uh, I never noticed many of these patterns, but once they were shown to me, um, again, the, the importance of reading scripture in, in a community, once they're shown to me, I, I you, you can't avoid them. And one of these patterns is the pattern of, of the younger brother uh, um, gaining the inheritance in one way or another, instead of the elder brother. And so we, we encounter this pattern uh, with, with Cain and Abel, right off the bat, uh, where it is Abel's sacrifice that God uh, it seems uh, of, of greater worth than Cain's. And after Abel's death, it is through the line of Seth, not through the line of the elder brother Cain, um, that God's remnant is kept down to Noah. And we see the same later on with uh, Isaac and Ishmael, with, with Jacob and Esau, with uh, David, the youngest son, and ultimately with, with the younger people, with the church. And uh, returning to Jacob and Esau, and, and that moment, not where Jacob claims the inheritance um, through the purchase, uh, but rather when the two sons come for the blessing when Isaac is nearing death. And Jacob is out, or rather uh, Esau is out in the field and uh, Jacob's mother, Rebecca, uh, knows what's about to happen. And she already knows that in, in the will of God, it is the younger that um, to whom the inheritance should go. Because when she was pregnant with the twins, they were 
uh, causing her such uh, pain in her womb while still in her womb that she she went to God for for explanation. And it was revealed to her that the younger shall rule over the elder. And so she already knows, Rebecca, she already knows that it is to Jacob that that um, Isaac's blessing should go. And so she helps him um, prepare the meal for Isaac. And she clothes Jacob at one point with, with the garments of Esau. And, and he goes in and receives the blessing. And there's this Hebrew tradition that Jerome relates that these garments were not simply the clothes of Esau, that these garments were were priestly garments that part of that inheritance of the firstborn since this is before the the levitical priesthood there was a priesthood before uh, the levitical priesthood it's clear from uh, noah sacrificing and so on um, that that priesthood was passed on through the elder son and so when rebecca clothes jacob with the garments of esau uh, this is part of jacob uh, receiving that priestly blessing that he's about to get in its fullness from isaac that that here are the priestly garments. And so Jerome talks about this in the gloss and I, I just, I was blown away. And I started reading more about this and Jerome doesn't mention this there, but there's actually an old uh, um, Hebrew tradition that these garments of skin, these priestly garments were passed down uh, through the generations. And these were actually the garments that uh, God gave Adam at the expulsion from the garden as a means of doing sacrifice in, and penance for, for his sin in the garden and that these ended up uh, clothing Jacob. That's really fascinating. And uh, it's a really interesting example because it actually kind of points to their love for, I think we could call this like the historical or cultural context. Mm -hmm. Like if they had it, they loved it. And that's uh, a really neat example then mapped onto what I might call more of a literary context if you will or just a, a good way of reading scripture of noticing those patterns and i, I think uh, many people find like yeah that's something they're particularly adept at finding patterns everywhere um like they would they would put uh jonathan peugeot to shame like in the patterns that they could find <laughs> um i love that's no shade on uh jonathan yeah, peugeot. Yeah. thanks for coming on the channel um uh, no but like they i think he would agree um they they found them everywhere I, I really appreciate that any, any other examples you'd want to share with people sure there's another this is a moral example again relating to jacob and esau and and the moment when esau comes previously and and sells his um sells his birthright to jacob for the pottage and this is gregory the great um who's often very focused on on the moral sense of scripture and we mean by the moral sense not simply again not simply the explicit moral commands, like in the Ten Commandments, but uh, drawing out of all scripture, including the, the narrative parts, uh, morals for your life. And so Gregory the Great is reading through this and, and he's wondering uh, what, what precisely is the sin that Esau commits here in selling his birthright? Okay, there's one, you know, a sin of not properly valuing the priesthood, but he also says um, there's also a sin of gluttony here. Now, I remember as a young man reading C.S. Lewis, and I forget if it's in Mere Christianity or Screwtape Letters, and, and he has this conversation, C.S. Lewis, about gluttony. And he, he, Lewis made this distinction between a gluttony of excess, which is how we normally think of gluttony as too much food. And he, makes the, he says, yes, that is gluttony, but there is also a gluttony of delicacy, of uh, a, a pickiness of food of a refusal to eat food except the certain kinds and so i mean this was i took me it took me back as soon as he said it's like yeah 100 percent. there there's a gluttony of delicacy as well and then i'm reading gregory the great and and he says there are and lewis probably knew about this and was simply simplifying it for us uh who who can't understand these things so quickly but gregory the great talks here about um five kinds of gluttony there is, yes, a gluttony of excess, like we normally think of gluttony. There is a gluttony of a delicacy, well, really two kinds of gluttony of delicacy. One, a refusal uh, to eat foods except particular delicate foods. And two, a refusal to eat even normal foods, say you're having beef for supper, but a refusal to eat that beef unless it's prepared in a, in a certain way. So, um, so there's a gluttony of excess. There's a gluttony of you will only eat certain dainty foods you will only and a gluttony of you will only eat 
foods prepared in a certain way. And then there's also a gluttony of um, improper time when you when you're eating out of the proper time. You can think here about say snacking or uh, moments in life, especially in church life, where where uh, it's times of fasting. Uh, but even for the regular person who, who doesn't practice, say fasting, you know, I, I think we commit that kind of thing um, with with excessive snacking and so forth. Um, so that's four kinds: a gluttony of improper time, and then finally a gluttony of, and this one really struck me, a gluttony of. Uh, too much eagerness for base foods. And this is the, this is the gluttony of Esau here is that the food he is eating is fine. It's, it's a simple food, a pottage or lentils. It's a simple food prepared. Um, you know, it's prepared well, but not, not in an excessive way, but Esau, his desire for it is too ravenous for this base food. And this, I think is a very common sin. I think of the, the, I mean, I'm a school teacher that the ravenous that kids have for junk food. I mean, this is, I, I, I encounter this kind of gluttony all the time and in my own life too, like I fall into that quite often. But again, just the analysis of these things, it's remarkable. And uh, when I read it, it, the relevance to my life is not hard to make at all. And this is the other thing about scripture is that it's, as, as the medievals understood, it's, it's inspired by God and God uh, is outside time, which means that in the creation of the world, God had in mind us at the creation of the world. And in the inspiration of the w- scriptures, God had us in mind, which means that these scriptures were written with us in mind. They were written for us, for our edification. And so we don't, Um, It's not as hard of a task as we think to apply these to our lives because they're already applied to our lives for us in in the inspiration. Yeah, that that's really important there. You talked earlier that today we're so often kind of pitting Old Testament against New Testament, both in scholarship, but also I think just in how people approach scripture of New Testament. I'll read that Old Testament, like maybe a psalm and a proverb maybe Genesis or something like, but there's so much that just seems confusing and understandably. Right. But I think through something like the Glossa or just through seeing how these medieval readers and patristic as well interpreted scripture, we can see that these things were written for us too. Like there is, it's not, it might not be natural at first for us to find how to apply this. I'm not going to like uh, discount that it can be difficult and they're, they're hard texts to understand at times. But that doesn't mean that there's not something there for us. And I think by seeing how other people read, we learn virtues of good scripture reading. And I think engaging uh, with the Glossa will help people do that. And like you mentioned, you know, C.S. Lewis, when he's coming up with these things, I think many people forget that he was a medievalist, right? And that these things really shaped him. So when he's writing a book like The Four Loves, you know, going through these categories of things like that, it's a very medieval intuition there of categorizing things in those ways. I think I uh, did an interview not too long ago with, I hope this is his name, Dr. Jason Baxter, I think was his name, wrote uh, The Medieval Mm -hmm. Mind of C.S. Lewis. And I think, you know, C.S. Lewis is a, a figure that so many of us can relate to of, I've read him, maybe I want to be like him, I want to think like him. Well, it, it, doesn't just take maybe reading his books, but go to the sources he loved and stuff like the Glossa would have been right up his alley. I've really enjoyed getting to talk so much about the Glossa today. I'm so grateful for your work on it. I do want to just ask a a question or two about a new project or newer project you're working on before we wrap up here today. And and that's another uh, medieval text from John of Kent, and it's the Summa de Penitentia, which is um, a handbook essentially, right, on administering the sacrament of penitence. What drew you to this and what sustained your interest in it? Ah, yes. It, this is, so this is an older project, but it's just taken much longer to complete. Um, this uh, was a project uh, I began during my PhD at, uh, and as part of my PhD dissertation to, to edit this text. Uh, one Another professor of mine, at the Center for Medieval Studies, um, passed this project on to me, and it's also coming out of out of these early schools in the Middle Ages, uh, and this one more focused around the schools of canon law. But 
uh, essentially what's going on at this time in history, we can go back to the year 1200, is that there are, for priests, there are not yet seminaries where priests are trained. So they're not going off and receiving, say, 10 years of, of seminary education to teach them about the laws of, of the church and the theology of the church um, at, at a specific institution like the seminaries. They, they, those uh, Catholic seminaries don't come uh, into existence for another few hundred years. And so priestly education at this moment in history is, is largely an, an apprenticeship. So you're going to spend a great deal of time under uh, an, an older priest. And over time, you're going to uh, uh, be ordained and eventually become a priest yourself. And so you're, you're, you're learning in a more hands-on way. And that works well for learning the rituals of the church, for learning the, the liturgy and so on. It, it doesn't necessarily work as well for learning the theology and, and the canon law of the church. And so to fill that gap, there are these priestly handbooks that are becoming increasingly popular, these summa. And uh, the greatest of these priestly handbooks is um, the Summa Theologiae by Thomas Aquinas, but there are many works called the Summa of, of this or that, in this case, the Summa on Penance, the Handbook on Penance by John of Kent, written in, in the early 1200s. And so this was meant for priests as to, to kind of fill in the gaps to give them some of that more uh, intellectual understanding of, of the theology of the church and of the canon law of the church and how to imply, uh, apply that in, in the confessional. And also um, uh, some good psychological information. You know, you're going to have people of all sorts coming to you in the confessional and um, you're there you're there as a doctor of souls and you're there as a judge of souls at the same time and this is going to help you uh, be prudent in whether in your role as a doctor or as a judge of souls um, it's going to help going to train you in prudence and it's going to train you in um, ultimately the highest law which is which is the salvation of souls that's really interesting. The point about psychological maybe insight there too of being like the, the doctor and the judge takes me back to recently as one of the perks uh, for my Patreon. We have this reading group and we were reading um, the book of Pastoral Rule. And I remember everyone in it being just shocked by the level of psychological insight that St. Gregory the Great had in ooh, 7th century, 600s. Is that right? Seven, mm -hmm. yeah, right. um, mm -hmm. and it's incredible, and I think it's humbling for us to go back to these, what we would probably consider now like somewhat ancient relative to us texts, and see, wow, like all these things that we think we're discovering today, ha people have known for a really long time. You know, we're not the first smart people. In fact, they probably knew mm -hmm. a lot of things that maybe we've long since forgotten and can learn from. And so I, I hope that you know when people encounter that work and it comes out that they can learn things from it. And I know that people in reading the Glossa can learn a lot from that as well. I, one question before we wrap up um, that I meant to ask earlier, but and we'll go to the, the final four questions here. But for someone who, who picks up the Glossa, and, and I'm looking down because it's next to me here, um, <laughs> but someone who picks this up, they buy it and they say, I mean, I don't know, that'd make a beautiful coffee table book if I never even open it, which it would, but you should open it. Um, but like, how would you recommend someone who clicks the link in the description down below, they buy it on Amazon or wherever, and then they go like, okay, now what do I do with this? Like, <laughs> how would you suggest people engage with it? Do they read it cover to cover? Like a novel or are there some things they should think about as they get into it so they can get the most out of it? Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be very frustrated by the book because they're going to attempt to read it uh, like another book and, and uh, it's not going to go very well just due to the format of it all. Uh, so you, you can't approach it like other books. And this is in part due to to where it comes from. It's, it's a, originally a text used in the classroom. And so this is originally a textbook, if you will. Um, it's a set of teacher notes. And so you can't just read those in uh, a written format when originally these, these were delivered in a more oral format. So this is, uh, in a way, a record of this shift from a, an oral culture to a written culture. And, and it's, uh, um, at, over time, it becomes more of a reference work. And that's that's how people are going to end up reading it today. It's more of a reference work. They're, they're not likely going to read it cover to cover. They're going to uh, be doing a Bible study on, uh, let's say, the um, 
Jacob and Esau, and they'll go to that section and read their glosses there. Um, but that said, it also teaches us, um, even as a reference work, it teaches us that scripture in, in the Middle Ages was read very slowly. You, you can't speed read the gloss. Again, the format just doesn't allow for that. Uh, scripture was read very slowly, and it was read with a constant um, uh, interweaving of, of Bible and commentary. Even today, in, in a modern Bible commentary, it leaves you, the formats normally leave you um, the choice to, to read one or the other. And if you want to just read the commentary, you can. Normally, it's all segregated in the bottom, you know, and, and the scripture will be on the top or something like that, um, which enables you to kind of choose one or the other without without too much frustration. Uh, the way the gloss is set up is that you you can't really do that because it's interweaving the lines, it's surrounding the lines of biblical text, and and so it's interwoven in a way the Bible and the commentary that we're not used to, and so it's going to force you to read very slowly, and it's going to force you to read uh, with the mind of the church because you you can't ignore the commentary. Uh, it's not a, it's certainly not of the same authority as the Bible text, but it's there, and and it's uh, and it's not. Um, you can't dismiss it as easily as, as you can, you know, uh, uh, other other Bible commentaries. You can't just dismiss it. Again, it's not the same level, but it's not as easily dismissible. And so, uh, I, I'm interested <laughs> if your readers. This is a question I often ask myself. Um, you know, how to read this thing now? You know, uh, 900 years later, how to read this thing now when, you know, it outside of a outside of a university lecture course and you know i'm kind of playing around with my mind of trying to recreate that maybe doing a course at my church uh, using this again as, as a book in the classroom um, but i'm interested to see how other people approach it who haven't spent as much time with it who come to it for the first time and so if you're if your listeners buy the book and read it tell them to email me and, and tell me their frustrations or their their joys of reading it if you go to my website samuelclumber.com you'll see my email there and you can contact me so i, I want to hear from them how they end up doing it i love that yes and i'll just echo that people please do and you know maybe if i be so bold you know if you've got some friends you know the the good kind uh grab yourself the the glossa you know make some coffee get together on a, a saturday morning or something start your your study of genesis but this time rather than you know your usual study of genesis maybe study genesis with the glossa and with other people in that kind of communal setting where you are talking out loud and you can use it as a reference and continue the conversation. I think that would be wonderful. So uh, there's a there's a recommendation for some people coordinated in the comment section below to find out people who live near you and want to do that kind of thing. But this has been wonderful. I've really enjoyed this. I uh, thank you so much for your time. We'll wrap up with the final four, as I always do on this channel. Just four kind of rapid fire questions that I ask everyone. The first is what has been the most fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? The rosary. I, I needed something in my life very consistent and in a way simple that, that didn't take a lot of planning and but also something deep, inexhaustible. And for me, that's been the rosary, which I pray when I was single, I prayed myself every day. And now as a husband and, and with my daughter, we pray together every day. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Outside the Bible, what has been the most impactful book on your life? Th that would be... A specific book, I don't know, but probably the worst of C.S. Lewis, mm. uh, both in in fostering a, a love for for the church, for the history of the church, and and uh, for the Middle Ages, of course. Very nice. You're having coffee with your undergrad, early grad school self. Now you've done a lot of school. What's one piece of advice you'd give him for his future at, in theology and medieval history, or translating these works, however you want to take that? But what's one piece of advice you'd give your younger self? Uh, knowing what you know now? Spend as much time as you can learning languages, T take as many courses on languages as you can. It, it gets harder as you get older to learn languages, not just the the mental capability, but just the, the motivation uh, decreases as you get older and it's easier to, to learn these things um, as a youth. And as a school teacher, I can attest to that. You know, In a way, my kids are more capable than I am of learning I teach Latin among other things, and I, I wish I was able to learn as young as young as they are. Uh, but spend as much time as you can with languages. That would be my advice. 
you know, that's one that's come up several times, and it makes me want, uh, Lord willing, if my wife and I have kids uh, someday, to get them in on Latin and, and Greek at a young age. I'll see if she goes for that. Uh, but this channel <laughs> is called Gospel Simplicity, and so the last question I always like to ask is, in a sentence, what is the gospel? It's, it's the good news of Christ, and um, even if it leads to your martyrdom, and it it's still the good news of Christ. And and so we must all, if we want to participate in Christ's resurrection and his ascension, the only way to do that is to also participate in his death and in carrying our cross. And and that's good news, it's shockingly, but that's good news. Well, Dr. Klumpenhauer, thank you so much for this today. This has been a joy. Thanks to all of you who watch this sometime in the future. I don't take your time lightly either. So until next time, for all of you, be on the lookout for more videos. And far more importantly than that, though, go out and love God and love others, because truly, above all else, that will change the world.